He said in verse 14, so don't marvel about this. And no marvel. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing to marvel about if Satan himself has been transformed into an angel of light and deceived Eve, then cannot his ministers be transformed as a, a ministers of righteousness and deceive the people? But remember, 15b, the, their end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool. Uh, just because I stand here and make the statement like Jeremiah made, that just because a man's in the ministry doesn't mean that God sent him. Uh, they, they ran, but God said, I didn't send them. Uh, there's just as many men in the pulpit tonight that God didn't send as there was in Israel when God told Jeremiah that, that he had a problem, that there were a lot of men contesting his teaching that uh, pawned themselves off on the people as representatives of God, but, but God made the statement. He said, I didn't send them. Jeremiah 23, 21. Well, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And if God's people at an earlier day were plagued by men that were misrepresenting God to them, is it any mystery that right here at the end of the age that God's people could be plagued with with men and many of them with their collars turned on, uh, turned around backwards? Is it any mystery if God's people could be plagued in these last days with, with men that purpose to represent God, yet God never sent them? Paul said it was. Uh, Paul, Paul said it was. And, and we need to understand from the Word of God that just because Jesus came and built a church, this does not eliminate the church from uh, harassment from God's adversary. Uh, God's adversary, the devil, uh, is not yet dead. He has not yet been dealt with. Uh, he has not yet been uh, bound uh, with a great chain and cast into a bottomless pit uh, with a seal set upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years are fulfilled. Uh, Revelation 20 tells us that God's adversary is ultimately to be bound. But he that deceiveth the whole world is not yet bound. And when Jesus came at his first advent and, and built his church, he gave us a parable in the 13th chapter of Matthew. And this, uh, this parable that Jesus gave goes somewhat like this in verse 24. He said, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And he made the statement here in verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth a good seed is the Son of Man. Now Jesus built a church. But Jesus knew that the church that he built would not reach out in its, in its beginning purity and take the world for Christ. Uh, we, uh, we are faced here in America with, with another incursion by, by the Pope. And uh, everywhere this man goes, he is received with, with accolades and praise and uh, is worshipped as the Holy Father. Where did this system come from? How did this uh, pseudo-church uh, come into existence that claims uh, Peter for their first pope. Where did that system come from? Uh, Rome is asking all of the Protestant churches and Pentecostal churches to come back home. Rome is uh, offering the olive branch to all of the uh, uh, sects in Christianity that came on the scene after the Protestant Reformation, and, and she's calling them separated brethren. Uh, she's asking her daughters to come back home. But when you begin to study the Word of God, we find from the Word of God that Rome herself is the first uh, separatist movement from the church that came out of the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Uh, it was Rome that set the pattern uh, for all uh, other splits. Uh, Rome herself pulled away from, from the early church that came out of the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and in pulling away established a pseudo uh, church system that was in conflict with the church that Jesus Christ built. Uh, when you understand that 
that uh, that the Roman Catholic Church is not the church that Jesus Christ built, then we must go to the Bible and find the, the root for the formation of, of this system that claims over 800 million adherents in the world at the present time. <clears throat> it's very strange that, that when uh, the King James Bible was written, and if you have a, if you have a King James uh, Bible, which is the one that, that we use in this church, and we prefer the Oxford or, or the Cambridge uh, uh, translation, when this Bible was, uh, was, uh, was first uh, written in, what was it, around the year uh, 1611? Uh, when was the King James Bible translated? Anyway, <clears throat> all, all books that are written, usually they have a preface. And the King James Bible was written uh, right, uh, right after the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and, and you notice here in the third paragraph, of the, uh, of the preface to the Most High and Mighty Prince James. In the third paragraph, it starts, And this their contentment doth not diminish nor decay. In other words, the translators of the King James Bible were, were honoring King James for, for the privilege of translating the, the Holy Scriptures out, out of the Latin Vulgate and, uh, and the Greek so that the common people could have a copy of God's Word in their own hands, uh, which is something that the Roman Catholic Church had forbidden. Uh, there was no way that they would put the, the, uh, the Scriptures in the hands of the common people, because if the common people could read it for themselves, it would, uh, it would show them the error of their clergy, that was holding them in false doctrine contrary to the teachings of the Scriptures. One thing that the Protestant Reformation did was to put the Scriptures in the hands of the common people. And the King James translation is, uh, is, uh, is a mighty manifestation of the Protestant Reformation that gave us God's Word where we could read it for ourselves. And, and the, the translators are telling King James of England and this, our contentment, does not diminish or decay, but every day increaseth and taketh strength when they observe that the zeal of your majesty towards the house of, house of God does not slack or go backwards. In other words, as, as they saw the faithfulness of this king in his respect for, for the church and the teaching of the Holy Scriptures as, as God uh, gave them the light to understand them, they, they said that the zeal of your majesty towards the house of God and does not slack or go backwards, but is more and more kindled. They said this every day increases and taketh strength. Our, 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 our contentment does not diminish or decay, but every day increases and taketh strength. Uh, a good, sound leadership uh, redounds to the, to the contentment and the strengthening of the people. And as you see the faithfulness of your ministry, this should read down to your increasing joy every day. Uh, when, when your joy does not grow each day, your confidence, your faith, your happiness, then it's because you do not understand the, uh, the uh, wisdom of leadership, the necessity of leadership, and the profitability of leadership. Only a total rebellion would want to uh, be responsible for themselves and, and make their, their own plans and do their own thing. You'll never go very far uh, by following your own inclination. And just because we have the right to study the Holy Scriptures uh, doesn't mean that, that with, within our own self we're able to present that front that needs to be pre uh, presented effectively to take an effective stand uh, for God. But, but when, when strength stands and when strength uh, uh, assures the people that this is the way to go, then the people can follow that strong stand and this adds to the welfare of the people immeasurably. And this is what they're telling uh, the King of England that, that uh, it's easier for us and it's better for us because of the stand that you have taken. And they're saying that, 
that uh, our contentment doth not diminish or decay, but every day increaseth and taketh strength. When we observe that the zeal of your majesty towards the house of God does not slack or go backward, but is more and more kindled, manifesting itself abroad in the farthest parts of Christendom by writing in defense of the truth. And the Holy Scriptures hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. Isn't it strange that, that uh, 400 uh, uh, years ago, uh, at the Protestant Reformation, that, that everyone understood that the office of the papacy held the man of sin, uh, the son of perdition, the anarchist.